Hello, everyone. Welcome to this episode of eCoffee with Experts. I am your host, Matt Fraser. And on today's show, I have with me a very special guest, Neil Swindale. Now, Neil is the co-founder of Venn Central, a full-service digital sales and marketing solution for the refreshment services industry, headquartered in Pleasanton, California. He is a seasoned break room refreshment industry digital marketing strategist strategist with over 25 years of experience. His three companies are all focused on re-engineering the sales and marketing process for break room operators. Then Central is the leader in digital marketing solutions for break room operators with an emphasis on creative industry focused content creation. He originally hails from New Zealand and has spent 12 years playing professional basketball before coming to the United States where it has been his home for over 25 years. Neil, welcome to the show. Matt, I really appreciate you having me. We've had such a fun conversation up to up to this minute and look <laughs> yeah. telling you guys about my story. Yeah, before we even got started. So we were talking off camera, thought, man, we should record this. So tell me how <laughs> you did get started. Like, how did you come to America? What was that whole process? So I came, I came to America in college. I was working okay. at the Regent Hotel in Auckland, New Zealand as a luggage porter, which yeah. still is my favorite job I've ever had to this day. Oh, wow. Um, and then, yeah, I was just plucked out of New Zealand by a small junior college in California to come and uh-huh. play basketball. So I ended up playing basketball in college for four years. Oh, Met wow. an American girl in college, ended up getting married. Uh-huh. Um, so that was my first ticket to America, play basketball. Oh, right on. And then you got started in vending machines. How, how did that come about? Yeah, so I, we went back to New Zealand, played basketball professionally. Uh-huh. At 32 years old, I saw that I was, uh, could barely jump and was a little bit slow around the court, and I decided to hang up my boots, as we say yeah. in New Zealand. And I ended up coming back to California to – Silicon Valley, where my wife grew up. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just went to a job fair. It was right in the middle of the dot com days. So oh, yeah. all the technology companies were snapping up all the employees. Um, I showed up at a Coca Cola job fair. They probably mm-hmm. had 30 jobs available, and I was the only person to show up in a suit as well. I showed up in a full suit. Good for um, you. And I basically just looked at all the jobs and went, I'll take this one. And it was a sales rep selling Coke machines um, into break rooms. And here we are 25 years later. I've never left the industry. Wow. Hey, I've I've heard it said that the the goal of Coke is to get a can of Coke in the hand of every 12-year-old around the world. (laughs) Is that true? I wouldn't statement. say they, it's basically Coke's goal, if I remember rightly, was to get a Coca-Cola within arm's reach. Oh, okay. So I'm not yeah. sure about the 12-year-old. <laughs> okay. Well, they knew that, I heard they, they said that they knew if they got it into the 12-year-old, they would be able to, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. have a customer, have a customer for, life. for life. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And it's interesting. I had some friends who were uh, traveling and they were in the middle of nowhere in South America. And where they didn't think in a million years there would be a Coke machine. <laughs> yep. Oh my gosh. And lo and behold, there was a yep. Coke machine there. <laughs> yep. Well, that's I the mean, thing it about was traveling, in the right? of nowhere. You know, if you're in another part of the world and you don't know if the water supply is any good, you know if you drink a can of Coke, you're going to be safe. Yes, yeah, it's true. Yeah. Coke so you got started like it. Gold. Oh, it is. Yeah, it's a oh, when I worked book. for Coca-Cola, we would sell truckloads of Coca-Cola. And once that price dropped 25 cents to 50 cents a case, yeah. you know, we'd have companies order two, three truckloads of oh, product because wow. they knew that it was selling. It's yeah. not going to sell. Yeah. So it's a pretty no, amazing it's... start into this industry. Yeah. So you got hired by Coke. And how long did you work for them for? I worked for Coke for two years. Calling oh, okay. on the vending companies in the Bay Area. Uh-huh. And then I jumped over to Frito Lay and okay. sold chips to all the vending companies in Northern California. Did oh, that wow. for five and a half years. Mm-hmm. And then I did six years at Nestle Waters selling water to vending companies um, Western United States. Oh, wow. So I just kept getting a bigger territory for a different company. Yeah. 
you went from a little little a, a smaller territory to a bigger to a bigger to a bigger and yep. next thing you know you're solid yeah. wow. but i keep doing the same thing as we discussed earlier i found yeah. uh, when i walked into the vending company's office and sat there i was yeah. so intrigued by the process of putting a coke and a snack machine out in the marketplace coming back a week later and picking up $300 yeah um i was so intrigued with that story I'm 25 years in. I'm still intrigued, except yeah. now I'm calling on companies that are doing, you know, between 50 and 100 million. Wow. So Annually. Same story. They put machines out and come back a week later and collect. And then just do that over and over and over again with multiple machines. Exactly. Yeah. That's amazing. Exactly. And so you yeah. saw a unique opportunity in the marketplace in this regard that you were telling me earlier. Could you... Yeah. Maybe tell us again so that our audience can hear about it, how you got to where you are now. So one of the things I read, so first of all, I came to Silicon Valley. I honestly could not turn a computer on. If you gave me a laptop and said, fire this up, I wouldn't know how to do it 25 years ago. Wow. Um, But I, because I was in Silicon Valley, I told myself, I'm going to teach myself technology. And I remember my first bout of technology was AOL chat rooms. I would jump into an AOL chat room. um, I'd fire up that internet connection, which is that screeching sound to get the connection. (laughs) And I would drop into chat rooms. And I remember um, everyone was chatting and there was photos being transferred between everyone. And I didn't know how to do it. And I said to the chat room, I said, hey, can someone send me a photo just so I can see how this process works. So yeah. someone sent me a photo and to this day, I never saw it. I downloaded it, uh-huh. but I didn't know where to go and see it after that. Oh, okay. And now, now we know it's sitting in down in the download file, but I yeah. could never find that photo. So I don't know what the guy sent me. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, as I was bumping around the, the vending industry, I could just see, that no one was helping our industry out with online marketing, especially at the time it was just straight website design. And I'd already gone through the process of building my little vending company. I had a website and I was probably one of the first vending companies in the Bay area and possibly America to have a website dedicated to my business. Wow. And that was the start. I could just see that. Wow. Maybe I could, sell my little vending company and become the website guru to the whole industry. And yeah. we have. And that's pretty much what's happened. Yeah. No, it's wow. Really well. That's amazing. Um was was the vending industry slow to adapt and adopt websites? I, yeah. I would definitely say that our industry is slow to adopt technology in general. Um, okay. It's definitely picking up now. People realize that with the labor shortage and the gas prices and the freeways being jammed, that you need technology to run your business so you yeah. don't, so you can run it more efficiently. So, but yeah, it was hard. Every website I sold, yeah, no one believed me that they needed it. They were a industry wow. of cold callers. And I okay. can say for the first 50 websites we sold, we had to drag people on and beg and use, you know, kind of like my network of friends to help sell these things. Oh, wow. Because people so, just didn't see the need for... So even though you were in an industry that, you know, they usually say, if you want to make money, find a thirsty crowd and give them water or sell them water. So yep. you were kind of, in some ways, offering water to a crowd that wasn't very thirsty, but yet they, yeah, they exactly. still needed... They still need it. <laughs> they, were like, not, they were not thirsty. In fact, I'll tell you a story. The local yeah. vending company in the town that I live in, yeah, I went into his uh, warehouse. He was about a $2.5 to $3 million a year vending company. Okay. I told him my idea. I was pretty excited. It's like, Dan, I'm going, to, um, I'm going to start up a web design business focused on this industry. And he told yeah. me, I'll never forget this. He said, Neil, businesses don't come to us. We have to cold call them. Do yeah. not start this business. You are completely wasting your time. Yeah. And, uh, that was my think, first hater. Yeah. I realized that being an entrepreneur, 
you're going to yeah. hear a lot of haters. And oh, you for have sure. to somehow push that aside and just blaze forward. And he yeah. was completely wrong in what he told yeah. me. And I'm yeah. actually trying to find that guy because I want to tell him. Yeah. That. Well, maybe he'll watch this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's a thing is you can you have ideas. And they, you know, there's a guy named Jonathan Swift. He said, vision is the art of seeing things invisible to others. Yeah. And many times we as entrepreneurs see things that are invisible that people can't see opportunities. And, totally. you know, it's, it's how we make money. And we're, we're just, it's the knack of the entrepreneur to be able to see those things. I mean, yeah. you were able to see the need for websites and internet marketing yeah. inside sales and inbound totally. marketing for vending machines. And, yeah. you know, other yeah. entrepreneurs, well, Elon Musk yeah. was able to see what was originally PayPal and then yeah. disrupted the car industry and so on and so forth. Totally. Um, so yeah, yeah no, I definitely gonna... have that ability to see things that yeah. no one else has done. But gosh, yeah. sometimes that can be a problem because you know I've got some pretty cool brands here between the three companies that we have, but I can't stop seeing other things, and I, I need to know. shut it off so I can yeah. just execute on the three that are in front of me right now. I know exactly what you're saying. I uh, I had, I don't even know how many because I'm letting them go, but I had 155 domain names. And I'm like, yeah. you know what? There's no way in my lifetime I'm ever going to launch all of these. Yeah, so totally. I might as well start to forget about it and thin yeah. them out. Yep. Um, I mean, sure, would I like to keep them and, and flip them and, and you be a domain yeah. reseller, domain broker? Sure. But, you know, yeah. you got to really focus. So that's yeah. one thing. You have focused for the entire 25 years on one industry, which is something I wish I had done. Um, yeah. Now, that's phenomenal. And you have this unique marketing asset that, of your business, you can say, you know, serving the vending industry for 25 years. Yeah. Or oh, 25 years of experience. Yep. I, I, I have always been shy growing up. And I would never, I'm, you know, kind of humble. I would not really admit to my strengths. I think yeah. it's a New Zealand cultural thing that we have called the tall poppy syndrome. Is once oh, you okay. get too tall, people will just cut you. Well, New Zealanders will cut you down. Oh, so um, but I can honestly say, yeah, I've got some amazing industry experience over 25 years. Yeah. Um, just dealing with all the things that I've dealt with. Um, uh -huh. so yeah, I can definitely sit in front of anyone and be super knowledgeable about this industry that I absolutely love. Yeah. Um, and I, hey, but I, actually, one thing that you said that intrigued me was in this journey of being a digital marketer, yeah. we all jump on domain names. I'm the yeah. same way. I bought a bunch of domain names too. Yeah. And I was just online one day and I saw that no one owned the domain name Los Angeles Vending Service.com. Oh, yeah. So I did a search for New York Vending Service.com. No one owned oh, it. Wow. Miami. Phoenix, boom, within about an hour, I ended up buying a hundred domain names, all wow. big city vending yeah. service.com. Those and, are uh, I had a little high school guy who worked for me. He was a sophomore in high school and he yeah. knew web design. And so for uh -huh. $12 an hour, I employed him to put 100 websites up on all those domains. Did you flip them? That was one of the pillars of why I'm so successful today is all those domain names were kicking me in leads from all across America. And then what oh, I do wow. is I would call up the local vending company in Miami and Los Angeles and Phoenix and say, Hey, I'm sitting here in California getting vending machine leads for your city because you don't have a website. And I that would give so them smart. those leads. And you over time, them. I would give them away. And uh, I've probably given away more leads than I've actually got people over the years and unpaid. Oh, um, wow. But yeah, that that giving away those leads opened the door to meeting the owners of those local vending companies who eventually ended up buying websites off me. So I paid off. Oh, in the long run. so it's paid but for itself in other ways. Definitely. So you gave value. Itself. You gave. Here's a lesson. You gave value first. Before even asking for anything, totally. you gave value to build a relationship to make money yeah. down the road. I think that's my skill is I'm a relationship person. Yeah. I would say I'm a average 
salesperson from a technical point of view, I'm not going to have a fancy CRM and keep that updated and have all these proposals ready to go. I'm just not. I'm just a person that can just talk to people. Um, And then I see the opportunity and then I'll jump on it and try to make it happen. Those are my skills there. um, At at the end of the day, if, if, you know, at the end of the day, it's closing the sale that makes the money, how you do it, you know, certainly you, I think you would agree CRMs and all that stuff is, is valuable, but like, you know, if you get enough sales going, like I, I, I alluded to off camera, I used to sell cars. And and once you get over selling over 20 cars a month, you need to hire an assistant. Totally. Because you you simply can't can't do it. When I I worked for Coca-Cola and Pepsi, especially PepsiCo slash Frito-Lay and Nestle. Yeah, yeah. We were trying to go from old school to adopting CRMs. Yeah. And I remember a minimum of five attempts to get us old school sales guys onto a CRM and we yeah. all fused. Yeah. And we just acted like we didn't know how to do it. Oh. Uh, we, we would accidentally push the delete button and delete everything. <laughs> and, it was so and I watched these big corporations spend hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars, on trying to implement these CRMs. And us yeah. old school salespeople didn't want to do it. Okay. Now that I'm a business owner, yeah. if I could do one thing and go back to when I first started my vending company, yeah. I wish I started with a CRM. Wow. So all these people that I've met along the way and yeah. all their nuances about them if i could have entered those into a crm that crm today probably would be worth a oh gosh bit. yeah but no i just put everything into excel spreadsheets and it was yeah only i could interpret it if someone else looked at my excel spreadsheets they would not know what the hell was going on yeah. i had about on one big google spreadsheet i had about 50 um tabs of all oh. the different categories of our industry Oh wow! Um, and I right, could, yeah, yeah. All I needed to do was look at that entry into the spreadsheet, and I knew what was going on. Yeah, uh, but nobody no else, else would have known. And, and <laughs> <it out. laughs> do, do you do you think that um, the industry? So number one, it sounds like you've changed in regards to your philosophy and attitude towards totally. technology, but yep. CRMs, CRMs in general. <clears throat> Oh, every piece of technology I've changed. Like I said earlier, when I first came here 25 years ago, I couldn't even turn a computer on. Yeah. So now, I'm, you know, arguably all three of the companies that I own are all technology companies in some form or fashion. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, no, CRMs for sure. Um, building out and keeping current databases slash CRMs yeah. of your potential <laughs> clients is yeah. crucial, but it's so hard to do. You know, in the daily grind of a company, you know, you really need someone focused on the CRM, but then there's a cost factor, right? Because, you know, you got to pay them and then you don't see the initial results of building out that database of potential clients. But you will though, right? I mean, we both know that. It's just how do you communicate that to... Yeah. <clears throat> so, have you seen an attitude change in vending machine owners and companies in regards to CRMs? Starting to now. Starting to now. Yep. I have talked. You know, I talk to most of the big vending companies on a weekly basis, and I can honestly say there's only a very small percentage who excel at keeping CRMs current and up to date. <clears throat> I find that very surprising. Yep. Because when I was selling cars, I was the CRM guy. Like totally. everybody came to me and asked me yep. questions. If yep. they wanted to know something about the CRM, yep, I was the go- and I used it religiously. Like I totally. put notes every single interaction with the customer. I put notes in. Yep, totally. I was buying and, a car uh, last week, as we alluded to earlier in the podcast, yeah. and I, um, the guy, the sales guy was going to give me a $500 discount on the mm. current car that I was going to buy if yeah. they could put the three other cars in our family into the database. When was the when did we yeah. buy them? Uh, what was the value? Just so they yeah. could build their database. Yeah. 
And so that then they could follow up with you down the road and hopefully sell you another car. Actually, so check that out. That's actually really interesting is they were willing to pay $500 to get that data from our family of our three cars in addition to the one we're about to buy. $500. If you multiply that out per person per week, that gets very pricey, but it pays off in the long run. Yeah. And car dealers... I know how much money car dealers pay for leads and they will pay anywhere yep. from 200 to up to, I, I know of thousand dollars. If it's, if it's a, a hot lead that leads, they'll, if you refer a client to them or a prospect, a customer, whichever, and it ends up in a sale and you don't want money on the front end and you want on the back, they'll yep. pay you up to a thousand dollars. So it's a, yep. it's a very yep. lucrative industry. Totally. But in regards to your your thing, like you started, so you started this vending machine marketing and sales. And so your knack is you have been able, correct me if I'm wrong, to in some ways transition these old school companies and old school sales dogs, if you will, um, with old school mentalities of embracing inbound marketing strategies for the vending machine business. Is that correct? Yeah, I wouldn't. Yeah, I yeah, I wouldn't say everyone's embracing it because they still yeah, but, aren't. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I've definitely gone from zero to hundreds of customers. Um, yeah, and, and teaching these guys. So my company is set up. I have two managers that run Ben Central, and I'm okay. not involved in the daily grind at all. What I like to do is just yeah. bump around the industry and chat to people. Yeah, and what funny. I love to chat about is kind of what the title of our our um, podcast was today was yeah. teaching old school guys new age marketing techniques. Now, yeah. actually, it's sales first yeah. yeah, and marketing techniques. Yeah. Because in today's environment, they're, they're joint. Sales and marketing, a, 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 sure. a term coined by HubSpot is marketing. Sales yeah. and marketing are the same thing now. Yep. So. That's what I bump around the industry and talk about, post on LinkedIn, do little five-minute videos on things. Yeah. And then uh, once they talk to me, the goal is just to sell them and then drop them into that Venn Central system to Venn Central will do that for you or in collaboration with you. It's hard to do it for you. You definitely need to collaborate with us to make it work. So so, so what are some of the ways that you communicate those things to a potential vendor then, a potential company, I mean? You know, I would say to... my number one platform for me is LinkedIn. So yeah. I have a nice website. I have multiple websites, but I have a nice thin central website that sort of um, kind of lays up everything that we do. <clears throat> yeah. But the way that I communicate is through LinkedIn. I would say 90% of my leads come from LinkedIn. Oh, yeah. And, <clears throat> yep, it's just me posting crazy snippets of content on LinkedIn. Yeah. Um, a lot of shaking hands with vending companies as I bump around America. I'll put, okay. you know, I'm leading the biggest vending company in Philadelphia, one source refreshments. So lots of pictures of me and Bob, the owner, in his warehouse, checking oh, out his freezers so and trucks and refrigerators. And I'll pop that up on LinkedIn. And so as I wow. bump around America doing all these things, yeah. I've already connected with all the vending companies in America. Most of them are with me on LinkedIn. They'll see me bumping around. Yeah, And eventually they'll call me and go, Neil, we see you all across America talking to vending companies. What do you actually do? Yeah. And then that starts the conversation of marketing and sales and matching yeah. them together and helping them execute online. <clears throat> Are there any strategies that, like what strategies work for vending machines to, I know how you're doing it, but what strategies for them, inbound strategies in regards to their website? Um, yeah. Do, do you so my suggest strategy, them to do? Most of my strategies are, okay, we have platforms. A okay. platform being the website first. So you yeah. want to make that look great. Uh-huh. Uh, you've got the social media platforms and Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, yeah. actually blogging. And there's a technical element to setting them all up and synchronizing them so they sure. all work together. But then it's content content and more content, content. all yeah, I'm, focused I'm, I'm on yeah. telling the story 
that normally a sales rep would sit across from a prospective client, what is the story that that sales rep would tell them to bring them on as an account? That story needs to be told online across all these platforms. Oh, okay. That's kind yeah. of my strategy. Is what That's I smart. Oh, so, so it's telling the story. And yeah. stories, uh, a friend of mine had a course on story-based selling and yeah. story selling, story selling tips. Yep. Um, shout out to Troy White. He's a, a sales guy and a very accomplished copywriter. Yep. And, um, and uh, it's so important how story, yes. telling the story of, of, of whatever it is. Yep. And uh, even Donald Miller, his book, Story Brand, uh, yep. talks about, you know, developing a story around your brand and the hero's journey. And so I can yeah. see, I'm just amazed at how, you know, I talked to someone earlier uh, in an episode about how to make bring brands exciting as hell. <laughs> yeah. That was yep. the name of the, and I'm just, it's, it's fine. It's very interesting. She's just talking to me about sand and how you can make sand interesting. Uh, and she told me examples <laughs> of a sand company that she worked with. Yeah. I'm like, wow, that is amazing. Yeah. And so no, now there's okay. got to be some interesting stories around oh yeah. Do you have any? Like, honestly, off the top of your I'm head? a storyteller. I'm a. I am definitely a storyteller. And in yeah. my 25 years of um, in this industry, when I talk to a a fellow or a vending machine owner, you know, whether yeah. it's in New York or Miami, they went through a journey, and they generally started by buying a small route. Yeah. Maybe they came from corporate America where they got burnt out. They wanted to yeah. start up their own business so they could support their hobbies of playing golf. And going fishing. They didn't want yeah. anyone to tell them what to do. And about yeah. 20 years later, they now have a $10 million vending company. That's but, amazing. Um, you know, within that 10 years of building that company, they went through hell. Their trucks yeah. broke down, their transmissions broke. They they dropped vending machines off the back of the lift gates before it even made it into the company. They yeah. installed machines and then a month later got booted out. Um, oh. and to get to where they got to was an incredible journey. Yeah. And yeah, if you can document that journey online as and part just, of your content strategy. Wow. Amazing. So sharing like those, like let's say the vending machine's broken, like sharing, a, taking a picture yep. of that totally. event and sharing yep. it online. That, that's yep. a lot of work, but it pays off, doesn't it? That's, that's, how yep. you, that's how you have to do marketing nowadays. Totally. And that's what I do on LinkedIn. I travel America meeting yeah. and greeting vending and coffee and um micro market owners and yeah. i'm basically just documenting it as i go and sometimes yeah. it's funny sometimes um it's not as funny <laughs> yeah and it works and people end up calling me i've got yeah. so many linkedin stories wow of little pieces of content that i generated that have yeah. come back two, three, four years later. Wow. And someone will say, Neil, I saw that little cartoon you created two, three years ago. It was so funny. And it was that yeah. piece of content that not I noticed you online and have watched ever have watched you ever since. And wow. then back and results in a sale. That's so amazing. So, yeah. you know, for people out there and agencies out there and people listening, like, you know, B2B, LinkedIn is the B2B platform guaranteed right. yep and if you want to connect with people you know yeah bring value to the marketplace and and share your story that's that's Absolutely. such a powerful that's such yep. a powerful um yep. I, uh, I have noticed on linkedin too that um i posted a photo a week ago it was a picture of my daughter and i in this new office that we just moved into yesterday basically yeah uh, and I just said, hey, just took the keys to the new office. I'm so excited to be working with my daughter to start her digital agency yeah. um, in a whole different area, not marketing. Yeah. Um, and I just posted a picture of me and her online. It's had 5,000 impressions, 101 wow. likes, and wow. seven comments. So it's just 17, 70 or 17? 17 comments. 17. But still a solid... Yeah post for my yeah. little industry yeah. if i posted the most incredible business advice 
I'd probably get 150 impressions, five likes, and zero. So, you know, telling those personal things are what gets everyone to notice you. You know, it's interesting because I tried to give this same advice to the uh, general sales manager of the dealership I was the marketing director of. Told him he needed to tell his story and get more into opening up and, and he wouldn't do it. (laughs) <laughs> and yeah. so it's just kind of I know what you're saying is true and it works and I know that if he did it he would yeah like in the time of the dealership he got married he should have shared that on social media but totally it's yeah. it's hard to get people to realize that you know people yeah. buy from people so totally. if yeah. you can personalize yourself from being a corporation into a person yeah you remove that you remove yeah. so many obstacles to people doing business totally. with you. So right across uh, the street from my office, well, uh, first of all, at the end of my office, I have a big window, a big bay window, and it looks across the street. And on the opposite oh, yeah. side of the street is the Meadow Lark Dairy. And okay. it's, a, it's a drive-up dairy where you can get milk and bread, and it's just a drive through uh-huh. But they sell ice cream. And it's okay. soft-serve ice cream. Yeah. On a Friday night at around 6 o'clock, on a nice warm uh-huh. day, yeah. there's literally 150 people in line, and there could be 65 to 70 cars lined up to go and get ice creams from this dairy. Yet two blocks down is Baskin and Robbins, quarter yeah. of a mile away is Cold Stone. Okay. Um, all the big competitors from an ice cream perspective are surrounding this dairy, but yeah. everyone comes to this dairy. And it's because of the culture of the dairy and, and the storytelling behind it. Wow. Um, so that's just a good example of small business with the story being told constantly. All of Pleasanton knows that if you want to have an ice cream on a nice warm night and it's part of an overall experience with your family, you'd go yeah. to the Metal Lake Dairy. And you might wow. have to stand there for half an hour to actually get your $2 ice cream. But it's yeah. just part of um, it's part out of the with them. yeah, so, and it's, and they they've built a culture around their yep product exactly. yep. that draws people and attracts people. Yep, and actually, one of the big culture building things they did was um, one of their staff members released a video on TikTok. Oh yeah, it had hundreds of thousands of views. Oh, um, and it made it. I mean, it was already popular. But it was overly popular. And now all the, you know, the 13 and 14 year olds are coming to the Meadow Lark Dairy and creating their own TikTok video around that dairy. Oh wow. So yeah, now social media, I mean, it's just changed so much in the last 20 years. Yeah. 2007 was when Facebook first. So how many years ago was that? It's uh the time of this recording. It's yeah. Yeah, it's, it's you know, even MySpace, you know, was out before then. So, you know, at least 15 <laughs> years that Facebook is, at yeah. least 15 years Facebook's been online and MySpace. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So, you know, I would love to have you back and talk about some of those other things uh, of how you've, uh, you know, utilized campaigns and strategies about uh, yeah. using LinkedIn. If, if, if yeah. you would, I'd love to have you back on the show. Oh, I'd love to come back. It's funny, yeah. right? We had that big list of questions before. Beforehand, that yeah, was we didn't touch one of them. <laughs> <laughs> it was more about relationships and storytelling. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, though. But it's a value. I, I, I know our audience will, 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 will get an extreme value from it. So, yeah. Hey, yep. what would you say is one big thing though you would like people to take away? Uh, if you could share one thing. Gosh, for me, you know, being an immigrant coming in from New Zealand. Yeah. To America, the land of opportunity. Yeah. It is all here. I hear a lot of people complaining right now about stuff. And gosh, I, I honestly, I have, I, like I said, I didn't have technology skills. Mm-hmm. I just had wake up in the morning and attack life with enthusiasm is my yeah. skill. Yeah. And on top of that, I've parlayed that into a digital marketing career. Yeah. I graduated from college with a PE degree. And I can honestly tell you, my coach said to me, Neil, 
to compete in college athletics in America, you have to have a 2.0 GPA. Uh-huh. It's basically a C. And I'm like, yeah. sweet, that was my goal. So after four years in college, I achieved a 2.0 and I got yeah. a PE degree. And here okay. I am 25 years later with three <laughs> companies focused on online marketing. That's amazing. So, so in other words, don't, you know, don't limit yourself and, totally. and yeah. go with Just gusto. Count your blessings yeah. and get after it. Because yeah. we, you know, if you live in anywhere in North America, whether it's, you know, America or Canada, the opportunities yeah. are yeah. right there. You just have to go and get them. Absolutely. Hey, how can our listeners connect with you online? Thank you for sharing that. I'm on LinkedIn. So yeah. just under my name, Neil Swindell. And then my okay. website's eventcentral.com, coolbreakrooms.com, and zipnesses.com. Okay. So any of right those. On. Four right on. Places we'll make sure to put find. those in the, in the description in the show notes. Hey, it's, it's it. been a pleasure. Uh, been a pleasure, absolute pleasure having you here. And, and uh, we'll definitely arrange to talk to you again. Yeah, I appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. It was yeah. fun. Yeah, you as well.